Happy Friday, everyone. This is the first Friday in September, Friday, September the 4th of 2020. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. We praise God for the opportunity to come before you today. And we know that this is going to be a wonderfully exciting time. And God is moving his grace and his mercy endures forever. Um, we have just so many marvelous things to talk to you about today and as we continue to move forward with the blessings of God upon our lives. So let's just get, get down to business right away. Um, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together um, in your name to become one and unified according to your grace and your mercy. Lord, I thank you that your mercy is renewed every day. When we awake each morning, Father, may us always, we always be mindful of the fact that you have awakened us. It's not our alarm clock, Lord. It's not the sound, the, the random noise or anything like that that has awakened us, oh God, but it is because of you that we are alive to see another day. And I thank you, Lord, for those people that you have chosen uh, for a specific task, and Lord, knowing that they will live out their lives here on this earth until that time ha has been completed, until their assignment has been um, reached its fullest potential in everything that you have assigned for them to do, Lord, may they live and may they continue to advance your kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you for the day. I thank you for your favor. And Lord, I just speak favor and blessings over your people right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, there are people who have needs all over the world. I'm talking about your body, oh God, that meet every financial need because many people have reached a point over this past um two weeks over last Monday, and I know there are moratoriums that are running out all over the country, and some have already run out, Lord, for the people who are behind in their rent, people who have lost their jobs, Lord, but you are their hope, Lord. You are their source. You are the provider, oh God, and I ask that you meet the needs of your people. Show yourself mighty in their lives, oh God. And give them more than enough. Send the resources for to pay their rent, to pay their utilities, to keep their phones and their internets and things like that off. But also, Lord, teach them how to be frugal. See, during this time where they have less than they have uh, been used to having, Lord, teach them how to cut back on the things that they really don't have to have. I mean, sometimes we do need to strip down to the bare essentials, oh God. But even when we have done that, oh Lord, you are still the God of provisions. You are still the God who provides for his people and gives them a harvest of 100%, even in times of drought and famine. Oh God, stretch out your hand and be merciful and grant favor and send the resources to your people from whatever whatever corner, whatever possible means you can, whether it be through financial assistance from agencies or people, oh God, even down to the point where when they're in line at the grocery store spending their last on food, Lord, that someone, that you would touch the heart of someone to pay for their groceries for them, oh God, and for the things that they need for their children and for their household, Lord. Send your angels to speak to the heart of the people that are on the other phone line. Forgive their rent, oh Lord, and extend the moratorium on utility payments, oh God, because it's still hot across most of the nation, and many people will find it extremely difficult 
to survive without air conditioning, and not to mention those people who are without power because of the storm. But I'm speaking specifically about people who have a shortage of an income coming in, and they have no signs of another job or anything to replace that income. But Lord, as they look to you, oh God, I'm asking for you to bless them. Bless them with the abundance that open the windows of heaven and shower down them blessings, Lord. And then also, Lord, send healing, emotional healing to those people who are in distress, for those people who are trusting you with all that they have, but the pressures of life are mounting up around them, and they don't know which way to turn. But, Lord, we know that you are in control. We know that your word tells us that you will work all things together for our good, for those of us who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose, Lord. May we meet the criteria, Lord, that we love you and we are called according to your purpose, oh God. Meet our needs. Meet our needs according to your word, according to your plan and your purpose for our life. Show yourself strong, oh Lord, so that you may be glorified, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, bless the people spiritually as we draw closer and closer and closer to you. We've completed a 30-day last month of August. We completed a um, consecration. And, Lord, I know many, I've heard many reports of people who have had a good report of, of how you're speaking to them and, and they're hearing clear and they're seeing clear. But, Lord, manifest your power in a great way in their life. Give us a refreshing and a refilling of your Holy Spirit so that we will hear with clarity. Give us discernment so that we can see and not be blindsided by the enemy, so that we will know when things are coming. But help us to prepare with that spiritual power, with a new filling of the Holy Spirit, that that the fire of the Holy Spirit may have burned up everything that's in us that is not of you, Lord. Help us to rid ourselves of all of the uh, behaviors and the habits that have kept us from coming into that place with you. Help us to shed those things. And Lord, as we have come off of the consecration, let us not go back to our old way of doing things, Lord. Let us continue in the path of developing that closer relationship with you as you continue to bless us and speak to us and comfort us and teach us by your spirit. May we walk in the spirit so that we will not fulfill the, the lust and the desires and the passions and we would not allow them to overrule us, Lord, and not be governed by our, May our bellies no longer be our God. May our emotional uh, stability become sound with the time that we spend with you. May the word transform us into the new creation that you have called us to be. Help us to surrender our lives to you, O oh Lord, as we lay down everything, as we lay down our hopes, we lay down our dreams. We lay, we lay down our plans, Lord. We lay down our passions and desires for whatever it is, God, that separates us from you, from, from those things, Lord, that have surmounted and they have separated us from your will and your plan and your purpose for our life. As we prostrate ourselves in worship and submit ourselves completely under your authority, then we give you the right to direct our lives, oh God. And I thank you. And I ask that you bless us physically for those who are, have, have been struggling in their bodies, oh God. Speak to them on what they're, about what they're eating, about what they're doing. If they need to take exercise, Lord, speak to them about what they're putting in their body because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us another chance, oh God, to get this right. And Lord, as we we are preparing for the another consecration beginning in October, let us prepare for that time and get our mind and our bodies shifted and focused on you and not wait until then, but as we gravitate towards it, as we continue to pray, as we continue to seek you, and we have an expectation of a of a spiritual explosion happening within the hearts and minds of the believers all across the world, all under the sound of my voice, oh God. And I thank you and I praise you. May you be magnified right now, oh God, today and forevermore. In Jesus Christ's name, our Lord, our Savior, and our Judge, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Thank you, oh God.
Amen and amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. As I said, happy Friday to you. We are so grateful that you're taking this time to join us. We are excited about some of the things that have been going on. Um, I have a, a wonderful praise report that I would like to share. Now, we are here Monday through Friday, 10.30 a.m. Central Time, okay? And then on Tuesday and Thursdays, we're here at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. There's no broadcast on the weekends. I rarely even turn on my computer on a Saturday. Saturday day, Saturday today. <laughs> Saturday is my Sabbath. Saturday is the day that I rest. I don't do any shopping. I don't do anything on Saturday as far as like going out of the house and doing whatever, whatever. I don't do any of that anymore because the Lord began to deal with me some months back, but during the month of August, he told me to that I need to start observing the Sabbath. Okay, so you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm uh, observing the Sabbath. And I had, um, I lost as my daughter yesterday about going to all these because there's some things that I want to buy and some changes that I'm making in my diet um, as a result of this last month's consecration because I'm overweight. And let me just tell you honestly, I am still grossly overweight. Uh, I was I weighed in on August the 1st at 242 pounds, and then on September 1st, I weighed in at 212 pounds. And that was because of the consecration in the fast. That, that's why. But also while I was on that fast and coming off of it, the Lord was dealing with me because I've been praying about my weight for years. And I'm not expecting to wake up saying it. I'm like, hey, Lord, if you want to do that. But you know what? The Lord doesn't deal with me like that. He says, you need to learn your lesson. You need to learn that this is how you do this. And I know there are testimonies of people who just instantly lost weight during, you know, service or whatever. And I'm not mad at them. I'm glad for them. But the Lord talks to me about being disciplined. He talks to me about disciplining myself and having self-control. So this is the fourth day of coming off the fast. And I have had, uh, I've been talking to you guys all week about it because I'm excited about what God is telling me. And I was sitting up here because I forgot to uh, uh, plan my menu for today. And uh, I had been, I had done good about it because basically for the first three days I ate, I ate the same thing. <laughs> so, but today things are, I changed them up a little bit. And um, I'm ready to start uh, eating green salad and stuff like that. So I'm going to be going to the store in a little while. Got to go today because I can't go tomorrow. I got one more banana for breakfast tomorrow. So, and uh, that would mean I would have to go Sunday, which means I would have to either go early before I ate or not have a banana for breakfast. I prefer to have the banana for breakfast. And um, so that means I'm going to go today and pick up some bananas and some greens. Uh, Salad mix, spinach, and kale. That's what I'm going to have. And I'll probably eat that over the weekend. I'll eat it until it's gone. I love salad. And I can, trust me, I can mix some stuff up in some salad. And uh, it'll be delicious. I most likely won't eat. Maybe I'll have some tuna tomorrow, which will be my first flesh. And because tuna is fish and fish is a flesh. So no kind of meat still. Because I don't want to go in, into my old bad habits. I don't want to fall back into them again. And I'm, I'm really liking uh, planning the meals and trying to eat before by a certain time. Last night, it, I was still full from lunch, so I didn't eat before last night's broadcast. So I ended up eating later, which is not something that I really, you know, I, I'm, I want to be obedient and eat by 7 o'clock. You know, so, but that means that... Um, I can't eat as much, cause though, but I tell you, those lentils were very good, and they were thicker than I re I thought. They they were really thick, and they had they sat heavily on my stomach. So um, uh, I, I'm gonna have to, you know, consider that instead of eating a second bowl, I'm probably I, what I probably need to do is add a little bit more of something else in the mix with the with the food, and I'm going to. Um, I'm planning on doing that today so that uh, the minestrone soup that I made uh, yesterday uh, that I had for dinner last night, I'm going to have it for lunch today. And if I go ahead and add the, the last of the tomato sauce to it, it'll be enough for lunch and dinner. And then I can have a small salad with dinner 
and instead of eating two bowls of it at lunchtime, I'm going to, you know, mix it up a little bit. But anyway, what I want to talk to you about is a couple of things here. We, we are going to be talking about um, tips. Uh, I made this minestrone soup myself. Uh, I, the, I had some in February when I broke my fast. I got some. We were at the Olive Garden. But I decided to try and make this myself. And it, it turned out good. It's a, a lot thicker then I had wanted it to be, but then I only used my small crock pot. So I'm going to have to, but cutting back on this or that or whatever, you know, I'm just going to have to, you know, think about some of those things. But it was thick and hearty, and it was like, wow, okay, this is, this is really good, you know. Um, but what I, what I want to tell you is that we are planning on doing some real teaching on fasting. Now, I just pointed you to a video, which there's nothing wrong with it, but we're going to really do some real teaching, and we're going to start around, uh, I'm thinking, like, after next week, because we want, to, we want people to be prepared for the consecration. We want them to be prepared and know ahead of time, because I ran into a lot of people that didn't know about it, and they heard about, oh, I didn't know, and I've never fasted before, and things like that. So we're going to go into some real teaching about fasting, and we encourage you to fast. Even if you just do a Daniel fast, and I'm going to be honest with you, if you're going to do a Daniel fast, give it two weeks. Don't just do it for seven days. If you're going to do a, consecra a real consecration and a fast, seven days minimum, and that means no food, okay, just water or juice, all right? But if you're going to do a Daniel fast seven days, I'm going to say up to 14 days because you want more time with God, and since you're still eating, all right, let me just be honest, since you're still actually eating, you are, yes, you are denying yourself to a certain extent, but you are, just, but if you, what I want you to understand is that if you do a Daniel fast, give it 14 days, and within that 14 days, you should be able to squeeze out a couple of days where you don't eat at all. For those people who have not ever just not eaten all day, if you've cut down on what you're eating and you continuously cut down incrementally, then you can go a whole day without eating and it won't be as big of a deal. You understand? Or even down to one meal a day, you can do that uh, for a couple of days and then no meal and then you can work your way back up again like that. You can go up and down, but you need to get to, we, we've got, we have got to get to the point. Well, we do not eat at all because that is really true fasting. And I'm not going to tell you that God doesn't accept the Daniel fast, but I'm going to tell you, when, if you want to be a spiritual powerhouse, and fasting does not guarantee you spiritual authority, don't get me wrong, but when you deny yourself, when you deny your flesh and your your soul, those things that it really loves, and you actually build up your spirit, man. That's how you become a spiritual powerhouse because you clean out all of that stuff. It's just like a, in your drain pipes to get clogged. I think, I, <laughs> I think Miles Monroe used the same analogy. You know, when you clean out your pipes, you know, you put the drain old foam or whatever, and it's supposed to, how it does in the commercials, you know, it cleans all of it, it's clean and nothing left. Well, you know what, that's how you can clean your spiritual pipes out as well, because you clean out all of that other gunk with the no watching the TV and the minimizing on Facebook and all this other stuff. So, and like I said, we've been talking about that all week, and because we want to, we want to remind you, we want to share with you whatever ground you gain, you don't want to lose it back by going back to your same old eating habits. That's why I'm taking it slow. That's why I'm taking my time with eating and planning my meals and, and eating some things that I had not really eaten. I would randomly, I love fruit and I always have fresh fruits and vegetables, but I randomly eat them. I don't plan, you know, I just get hungry and I just might go and grab this, this. I may make a big old bowl of fruit, you know, and I may, you know, nibble on that, but I don't plan that this is what I'm going to have for lunch and dinner. And this is what the Holy Spirit told me to plan your meals, plan your meals. And then he said to set the times to eat. So I need to eat by a certain time in the morning and then eat by a certain time at lunch and then eat by a certain time at dinner. So Last night, like I said yesterday, I was a little behind because my stomach was full 
all right, and you don't want to, uh, but I do want to be obedient. I have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit because that's what it was all about. The whole point of consecrating yourself is to get closer to God. You know, yes, losing weight is a byproduct, and that's something I absolutely do need to do. Uh, let me tell you. So I'm looking forward to the month of October and being able to consecrate myself and fast again because in um, in August I I did the Daniel type fast for 14 days, and then the last remaining 17 days in August I fasted, and there was just water only. I want to do it. I want to do 10 days of a Daniel type fast, and I want to do 21 days of uh, of a true fast, and that means it'll take me a week after to get back to like where I consider whole foods or eating meat, and you know of any kind, and like I said. Uh, Sunday, I will probably um, eat um, what you call it, um, tuna, which will be the seventh day because I'll go from uh, what was it, Tuesday to well, sixth day, whatever, close enough. But just a little packet of tuna, no, no big deal. Just one of those little packets of Star Kiss tuna that you can get that's already seasoned or not, just a little one serving thing. That's what I'm going to have. So it's not like I'm going to take a whole can of tuna and put it on my salad. No, but if I did take a whole can of tuna, I would use it twice, you know, half for, you know, lunch and then half for dinner. But I'm just going to use one of those. And as I slowly get back into eating, and it could be, you know, we could be, you know, another whole week or so before I ate any beef because beef is still the heaviest meat. So I've got fish. And which will be first after the tuna is going to be real fish and then chicken. And uh, we'll see what else I have up there, you know, in the freezer because I'm, I'm going to eat what I've got. I'm not going to go out. If I don't have it, I'm not going to buy it. I know I've got some, some lamb chops, two small lamb chops. And that's going to be enough for a meal. So I, I'm going to be eating whatever I have. And uh, instead of buying more right now, because I still have a lot of food in my freezer. I still have a lot of food, and then I've got a bunch of food in my daughter's deep freezer, and it's all meat. So what we're talking about is we're talking about taking it slow because if you are overweight and if you need to lose a lot more weight, then, yes, fasting is a good way to get you started, but you also, when you go back to eating, you don't want to go back to your old eating habits. You still want to take it slow. You still want to portion. and um, a smaller plate or a smaller bowl is, is going to do just fine because if you fill your big plate up, you are not going to be able to eat it. You're going to be sick. And if you eat the wrong thing, you're going to be sick. Now, there's a young lady that talked about after doing like a Daniel fast and she ate a chicken wing, one chicken wing, and it just sat in her stomach like a rock. And then, and then at another time she was talking about eating um, she ate some fish, some flounder, which is a light, light fish. And uh, she said it sat in her stomach like a rock. And so well, you don't want to eat. And she just did the Daniel fast. She, she just, that's all that she did. She didn't stop eating at all. I mean, food. She just, you know, she didn't have any days where she didn't eat. And hopefully she can work her way up through the next, because she's planning on doing it again, and I'm going to talk to her about why don't y'all, why don't you and your household do 14 days this time instead of just seven? Do 14 days. You've done seven, or do 10. You did seven, do 10. You know, and work your way up to where you can actually do a whole month. Your body will feel better. Um, one of her daughters who has really bad acne and her skin. And uh, because it means no carbonated beverages, no carbonated beverages of any kind, and no sugar. The little girl's skin looks so, I saw her, I was like, wow, her skin looks so so much better. And she said, yeah, yeah, it was the soda, between the sodas and the sweets. The two things that are automatically cut out. The three, the big three of, of Daniel fasting with food is no, no meat, no carbonated beverages, no sweets. Cutting those, at least the, the, the sweets and the carbonated beverages out, it was helping to clear that child's skin up. And it's like, so now you're going to have to think about, I said, because you need to identify what it is that's breaking out her skin like that. And if you're drinking too much, and some people just cannot drink the sodas. They just can't. 
because, you know, there's something about the carbonate, and it's not about caffeine-free or caffeine, you know, and caffeine is a factor. But um, they have to, um, you're going to have to identify that, and sacrifices that have to be made. If you want your skin to be clear, you want to run around looking like a pizza, that's up to you. If, you, if you're okay with that, but if you cut out the sodas and your skin is clear, you look better, you feel better about yourself. It, I mean, that's just the simple logistics of it, all right? So um, while, we, while we've been, you know, discussing that, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to do my best next week to stay off the subject other than just to, you know, uh, to give God glory for what he's doing. In, uh, in my life and as I get reports from other people about, and testimonies are sometimes slow to come through, and that's okay. And But what I really, really, really am excited about sharing with you guys today is that um, I did just, a, uh, we've, been, we've been praying, we pray for, you know, all kinds of stuff. And uh, we, as the Lord leads us, especially on our Tuesday and Thursday, uh, broadcast because we do we spend we have a list of things that we pray for so we have been in the evening we've been praying for because there's a young lady who co-hosts with me and she's a teacher and she's uh in a daycare facility she works for one of these national daycare uh groups and um she has of course a heart for the children and that, that's fine no problem and uh, so we pray for the children we begin to pray for the children specifically because I, there was a young man well, actually, it was a little boy that uh, someone posted in a group I belong to on Facebook that he was missing. His grandmother reported and was asking for prayer because he was missing. You know, and I tend to pray right in the comments. I write my prayer, I boom, right then and there because I want to pray. And, you know, I won't just say, oh, I'm praying or prayers. No, I mean, and I'm not mad at anybody who does it, but I'm saying, no, this is what I'm praying. And, you know, I'm going to let you know this is what I'm praying. If you want to get in agreement with that and pray that prayer with me, wonderful. A couple of weeks after, I asked, well, is there any report on him? And they were like, no, they got not, not gotten any word. And see, here's the thing. Some people will ask for prayer. And you pray for them, and you never hear back from them. You never hear. You can ask them, well, what happened? If it's a doctor's report, if it's a sickness or illness. And some people never report back what happened, even when you contact them. They ask you to pray, and then when you contact them and say, okay, well, we've been praying, and, you know, we were just wanting to know an update, and they won't, and they won't even respond. But the next time they want prayer, they'll ask you for prayer. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that. That mentality of you always want prayer, but you don't ever want to give God glory in a public format, just like you do when you ask for prayer, and you don't come back and say, oh, you know what? We went back to the doctor, and the doctor said this, oh, or well, they were well the next day walking around doing this, 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 and that. Let me tell you, 90% of the people who ask for prayer, you never hear from them again until they want prayer again. And I'm telling you that's wrong. There's something wrong with that kind of mentality because those people use God and the saints of God as if we were vending machines. And because they're going to come, they won't pray on their own. Most of them don't pray on their own. They don't. They'll come and ask someone else to pray who they know is praying, and they'll post the prayers and things like that for other people. That's wrong. I'm, am I saying don't pray? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that their behavior is wrong. And I'm asking God to, God to open their eyes to what they're doing because they are just using him. They are just using him for, to get their needs met, and they are not willing to put forth the effort that they need to correct whatever issues there are in their life. And let me tell you something. Everything that people ask for prayer about is not a prayer issue. There's some things that I don't pray about because if your attitude is, is, is such and such and such on a negative side, I can't pray you out of that attitude. You have to, because the Bible says encourage yourself. The Bible says that you need to pray if you're suffering and afflicted, James 5, 13. And we went through that. Y'all know that if you're familiar with this ministry. We went through that teaching in James that if you are, if anyone is suffering, let him pray. It didn't say let him ask for prayer. It said let him pray. But what has happened is that people have gotten so used to going and getting other folks to pray them through their bad habits and their behavioral issues, and people are quick to pray. It's like, no, I don't pray for stuff like that. 
I don't click on the amen or like or anything like that. I just know about my business because you know what? It's not a prayer issue. It's not an issue of prayer. And I'm, I'm ready to start putting that in there. This is what the scripture said. They need to pray for themselves. I can pray for their strength and that the Lord will enable them, you know, to hold on, you know, during this time of crisis or whatever they're facing and that they look to God and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to them the truth of the word, that's something like that. That's all. But I can't pray for their problem because most of the time the problem is within them and that is not something that we can pray people out of. People try, but you can't. You can't. And also, um, well, back to the, the young man because I'm thinking about some other, other prayer requests that have come up. But I, we never heard back. And I didn't ask again because the person who posted it you know, they never said anything else about it. But we began to pray. Uh, we were praying on, but it prompted me to begin to pray on the prayer line for missing children, for children who are missing all over the world into sex trafficking and things like that. But the Holy Spirit did reveal to me some of these children have not been taken by strangers. Some of them have been taken by their other parents, you know. And, and that happens all the time. You get people who are uh, couples who are divorced or, you know, never been married, and one has a child and they want to move or whatever. They just take the child and they disappear. They move into another state somewhere else. Sometimes they change their name. Sometimes they don't. And the child is missing, okay, and they're never heard from again. But they're raised by another parent. Sometimes even grandparents do this. They'll take the child and give them to a grandparent because you don't know where their grandparent lives or anything like that, and the child just disappears. And or other family members, sometimes they're taken by, they're, they are kidnapped truly by other people. Sometimes it goes into sex trafficking. And what I saw, we be, really began to pray about the people who are missing, and we begin to really pray and cry out to God on behalf of these children for God to and expose the, if it's if it's a you know the network whoever is involved in it whoever it is that's involved for them to be exposed and so that uh, the network can collapse because if you just find the children but if you don't if the network isn't exposed they'll just close up shop here oh that place got bust it's like a drug house it's like a crack house or you bust this house and they get burned out or whatever they just move to another location that's all that's how that's how they operate that's the spirit behind it that does it. So um, we, I began to see some posts where some children had been found, and I was thinking about that this morning, which is another reason why, you know, the Lord told me you need to get on a little bit earlier, you know, not just wait until it's time, you know, uh, at, at 10 after 10, I used to turn on the laptop, you know, get it going, open up all my programs and get everything ready for the broadcast. But he was telling me you need to you need to get started a little earlier so that I can have time to look to see what 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 whether there are storms in the area, hurricanes, you know, fires, volcano eruptions, you know, whatever is going on all over the world, okay? Earthquakes and things like that. So yesterday I had an opportunity to look up earthquakes. Uh, I had looked up the, uh, a couple of days before, like uh, if there were any hurricanes in the area, and I saw two, but they weren't really going to be, a, well, the one that, that went swept up through the Yucatan Peninsula up towards, uh, from South America up towards, uh, up to southern Mexico, uh, that one, and then one that was off in the Atlantic started uh, northeast of the Bahamas, but it was all out to the middle of the eastern seaboard, so it was nowhere near landfall by the time it dissipated. And but that that can change because this is a time where we will see a lot of hurricanes. So I want to monitor that so that we can continue to pray about these things. And uh, today I was thinking about the children, and I felt led to look at you know the found. I was looking for the post that I saw on Facebook, and um, I couldn't find it. And I was like. I thought I clicked like down there and I said, well, maybe I didn't because I didn't see it. So I just Googled the search and I found that um, I believe it was the same one, but this was recently, so I think it was last week when I saw it, but the same one, uh, 29 in Georgia, 25 in Ohio, you know, where they busted, you know, the houses um, and um, in Ohio and in Georgia. So, 
and somebody made a comment. I just kind of read it. They said that if we were looking for, you know, lost children every day, we will find them. Well, you know what? And the U.S. Marshals are doing this. They, it, as you be, you know, and think about this. As you cut back on law enforcement, you know, they won't have the manpower to do that. How about some people get in and volunteer to do that? How about some people to get in and volunteer, not just uh, – uh, I mean, because some, sometimes the parents can't spend all of their time looking for their missing child, but how important is it to you if it were your child? You know, I'm just, I'm just asking, how important is finding the children? It's important enough for me to pray for them and to continue to pray for them. So I copied the link from the, um, it was a USA Today uh, um uh, article uh, online, usatoday.com, I copied the link and I posted it, you know, to keep on praying. And I said, keep on praying for the missing children. This is a war, not a battle. Fight on. And just continue to pray for missing children. Because yes, as we pray, children are going to be found. And I did see some um, some posting. And you know, it, it just, oh, it was heart-wrenching. You know, it was just, just sinking. To know that um, eight over eight, uh, they talked about over eight thousand um, arrests, um, including members of Congress. Can you believe? I mean, yes, yes, yes. Thirty-eight members of Congress in the U.S. 38 members, 23 Democrats, and 15 Republicans have been involved in it. And I, I say, Lord, it, I don't care who they are. I don't care who they are. Expose them. Expose them. Expose them. And that is what I'm calling for. And we need to start crying out to God for judgment. Judgment on this kind of stuff. But congressmen, these are our elected officials. And do you think that they're capable of doing stuff like that? Absolutely. Yes. If you don't know Jesus, you are capable of doing anything. And even some people who do know Jesus have, who have not been delivered and set free are still capable of doing some horrible things like this, such as taking children and engaging in pornography and child pornography and all kinds of lascivious and licentious behavior, those big words that the King James Version use, but it's perversion, sexual perversion, indulging your flesh in any way that you can imagine and possibly think. So we want to continue to pray for our children. We want to continue to pray about the situation and the circumstances that we face um, in this world because the enemy's not playing. How many of those children, yes, and while a lot of those children were, uh, you know, taken by their parents, there were quite a few who were sold into uh, sex trafficking. And let me tell you something, drugs, drugs are a major factor in, in getting them to comply and to do whatever it is that they want them to do. Drugs are a major player in that. Um, so we want to always make sure that we, we keep the children up in prayer. We want to make sure that we, it, it's not about what you think. Let me tell you this right now. It's not about what you think, because most often what we think is just, it's just wrong. Truly, it's just wrong. It's, it's, it's not anything like the way we really think it is. It's nothing like what we really think it is, okay? We're not, um, what we want to do is we want to be sure that, one, we're on the right side. Two, we want to make sure that, um, and not specifically in this order, but we want to be sure that we are led by God in all things, all right? I, I don't want, to, I cannot stress enough 
what this means. Now, I want to share this with you because when I said that, it reminded me of something that the Lord was showing me, and I started talking about it last night. Now, this is what I heard um, yesterday morning during the time of devotion. Um, and I wrote it down. Bear with me. <laughs> Just a moment here. All right. Wednesday. Okay. Uh, this is Friday. Ah, uh, here it is. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, there you are. Okay, so yesterday at 9 a.m., uh, this is what the Lord says. The, and I had, uh, I, I honestly, I had looked at a um, um, a lady that I don't follow her on YouTube. I, list, I look at what, if I feel led to uh, look at her um, post, I will. And I felt led the other day to, um, I think it was Monday night, to look at her, what she had posted. And um, she was talking about being on the right side, and it was something that the Lord was dealing with me about because I know some people who profess Christ, and I really believe that they love the Lord, but they've gotten into, they've started picking sides. And there was one young lady in particular, and she had her new, um, um, profile where the Black Lives Matter thing around her profile. And I was looking at it and I was thinking about how I was thinking about the spirit that's associated with Black Lives Matter. Let me tell you something. I, and if you, if you don't know that, I, I know I mentioned it before, but I'm of, uh, uh, my ancestors were from Africa and my ancestors were from, uh, were Native Americans here. Okay, that's uh, the bloodline that I came, I came through. And my father, my father, you know, his, his, his father had been a slave. He said my father was born in 1907, and I was a, a, late, a late baby for him. You know, he was almost 60 years old when I was born. So, you know, I wasn't, he wasn't a spring chicken, so to speak, and I'm, I was his only child. So, um, you know, I'm black. I don't consider myself African-American. I'm black. I'm a black person, my mother was a Negro, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm not adopting all of this, this crazy stuff. And that To me, I, I'm just like, no, no. I didn't like the African-American thing. I didn't like that. So I don't, I don't consider myself African-American. I'm still black. And, um, but before anything, because I have to mark that on whatever, you know, forms. But I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm, that That's really my identity is not in the color of my skin. It's in the blood of Jesus that has purified me and redeemed me, and I have been born uh, from above. That's my true identity, okay? But in the natural sense, I'm black. But when I, I don't like this black lie, and I guess it's because I'm over the age of the young, you know, people who they get all riled up about stuff like that, and I was like, no. I have I experienced racial prejudice? Yeah, sure, sure I have. But you know what? It has never changed who I am. I I don't deal with people based on the color of their skin. I didn't uh, raise my daughter. And she's the only child. I didn't raise her to deal with people based on the color of their skin. If you're a jerk, you could be a jerk of any race, any color, and you're still a jerk. Your color won't have anything to do with how I feel about you. Because I have some good friends who are Mexicans, I've had, and I have good friends who are white. As a matter of fact, my closest friends are Mexican. Go figure. I have friends who are white. I have, I, I've known white people who have a superior attitude. I know black people that have a superior attitude. There are people in my own family who are racist, but they want to shake their fists about other people who look like, but you're a racist yourself. 
So, you know, I don't know how you can point the finger at somebody else because you're a racist. And, you know, and I know a lot of people in church, a lot of people within the body of Christ who are racist because the first thing they talk about is, you know, my white brother or our Caucasian brothers and sisters. It's like, hello, if you have to identify them by what race they belong to, you are a racist, period. Because when I say my friend, I say my friend. I don't say my white friend or my black friend or my blue friend or my green friend. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I don't say that. I just say my friend. They're my friend. And um, so I, I, I wondered about the Black Lives Matter thing, and I was like, Lord, I was like, you know, there's something wrong with this because if people are picking these sides, and I, I, I chatted with a little girl on Facebook. She, she posted this thing about whatever, 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 and the movement, and it's like, no, you know. And I said, well, there are people – they are violent. They do promote violence. They do promote hatred. And they are part of the movement. Well, they're not really part of the movement. Like, well, yes, they are. And But she could not even accept the fact that that organization has been infiltrated by people with their own agenda, agenda who are promoting violence and hatred. She wouldn't even accept that. They're not part of it. And it's like, you know what, well, that was a useless point of talking to her. And see, when your mind is so closed and when you think you're so right about whatever you are, when, you're, when you think you're right, you're dangerous because you will not even consider the fact that something could, could possibly be going on in this situation that you are not aware of. Won't even accept the fact. And I was like, okay, and that's another reason why, you know, a fanatic is blind to everything else that goes on around them except for what they say. And people say, well, I'm a fanatic for Jesus. It's like, no such thing. Jesus did not ask for any fanatics. He asked for followers. And the followers were commanded to follow his, his command, to do what he said, to do what he did. And they were never to ignore what was going on around them, but they were to address what was going on around them, first of all, through prayer and then through word. Because when you see something wrong, the first thing you need to do is pray about it and inquire of the Lord how you should deal with it. So this is kind of where I was with that. And I was like, mm, you know, I was like, oh, and I said, do is this something you really want to challenge? Because you know what, but it's something that needs to be challenged. It's something that needs to be understood. But I have to make my stand. And it's like, I don't get out there, although I am a registered Republican, I don't get out there and beat down the Democrats. I don't speak badly of them. You know, Joe Biden is a person who God loves. God loves Joe Biden just like he loves me. He is a soul that God doesn't want to see lost, no matter what he is. He loves Barack Obama and Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton. He loves all of them just like he loves all of the believers, okay? Even the false prophets and the false teachers, God still loves all of them. But... Are they going to go to the lake of fire if they don't repent ask for, and ask for forgiveness? Absolutely. He's going to have angels going to toss them right on in their head first. You know what I'm saying? But what I'm telling you is that with the Black Lives Matter thing, with the Republican Party, you know, the bipartisanism, you know, we we're splitting down the lines. We're talking about this is right and this is wrong and such and such and such. Um, the, the riots and, you know, the people that are isolated because of the coronavirus and they're angry because the government is not helping them or doing more for them than they should and such and such and such. You know, all of these different things. God is saying, what side are you on? You need to be make sure you're on the right side. And this is what the Lord said. He said, whose side are you on? And I was like blinking. <laughs> I was like, listen, I got my, I got, I, I did, I got up off the couch. I came around the de to the desk, got my notebook where I put in the things that I, I keep a record of what God is speaking to me about. And, and I wrote down, whose side are you on? Ask the Lord, because he asked. And he said, are you sure you're on the right side? Or are you really on the side of error? I was like, wow, okay, okay. My, my eyes was wide open then, you know. 
He says, you cannot go by your feelings of right or wrong. Like, okay. You cannot look in the natural and judge. You must identify the spirit behind the movements and factions you follow. For it is a spirit and it is not mine. I said, oh, Lord. Okay. I, I, there's more, but I'm going to stop right there because that's, that, this is what we need, to, we need to deal with right here and there. And my challenge to you is whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Just this is what God asks. Whose side are you on? And I always remember that scene from the Cecil B. DeMille's 1956, The Ten Commandments. And Charlton Heston has come down from the mountain. And, you know, we've just seen that wonderful scene where the finger of fire God writes the commandments on the stone tablets. And then, you know, you know, you know, it's just like if you would take your fingernail and, you know, draw them out, you know, like like the rock out of sand or clay or whatever. And I love that. I always just saw it. Just, yeah, I love it. I love it. And he comes down, and there's all this revelry and, you know, party. This is a major party going on down there in the camp. And he comes down, and he said that big booming voice, Whoa, Israel, you know. <laughs> I love that. You know, it's so, it's so amazing. And he says, you know, who's on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And people start running over there, you know, Moses, Moses, and they run over there. And then he lifts the commandments and he throws them. They hit the calf and the earth splits and the fire and people fall in and all that good stuff. You know, it's just a wonderful scene. But I always think about that, how, you know, Moses raises the law of God, the tablets, and um, he, when he said, who is on the Lord's side? Because I, I'm going to tell y'all, I pray for Lord to, to make a distinction between us and them. The line has been drawn. Let me tell you, the line was drawn. The Lord showed me in the spirits a few years ago. The line was already drawn. He said, a line has been drawn. You're going to need to decide which side you are. I had the purpose in my heart. Not only do we decide, but we purpose in our heart and we maintain that decision through what? Through not just our words, but through our lifestyle to what we do. Because at that moment, when you decide that you are on the Lord's side, then your life has to begin to change. All of that old stuff, you've got to let go of it piece by piece. The chains that you were bound by, the Lord will set you free at that moment, but you can choose to be bound again by the same foolishness if you're not careful. But the Lord says that you must identify the spirit behind the movement and the factions that you follow. If you don't, if the spirit of, if it's not the spirit of God, then it is not of God. Then you have no business over there if you belong to God. And he's going to release me because this whole thing is going to be shared. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. It's like one, two, three more sections to it. The next section is probably the longest, and then the other two are short. So it, but this is what the Lord is saying. Whose side are you on? Because whose spirit have you picked up? And can you, as a believer in Christ, come under the influence of another spirit that is not of God? Yes. Anybody that tells you you can't, that's a lie. Because you will not listen to the Holy Spirit because you are guided by your emotions. You are guided by your emotions and what you think is right. What you think, but you have not asked God what he thinks about it. That's what's the problem, where the problem lies right there. That if you don't ask God what he thinks about it, then you're automatically wrong. Why? Because you belong to God. You have been bought with the price. The precious blood of Jesus has paid the price for your life. For you do not belong to yourself any longer. You have no right to make those kinds of decisions, what you would spend your energy on and your time on. And why are you spending time on that foolishness that's of the world that's going to pass away? But it is all designed to bring division. What does it cost? Division. 
Black people can kill as many, black men can kill as many black folks as they want to, and nothing is said. No crime vigils, none of that. They go through their own neighborhoods shooting up houses and killing innocent people. You, there's, 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 you have one uh, a gang member that lives in this house, and they did whatever they did. But it's a house full of people, other people live in that house that are, do not belong to the gang. But they'll ride by with their guns, and they will shoot up that house. And who, they don't care if the person is not even there. They don't even care. They will shoot up and kill and maim anybody. Children playing in the, in the yard on the street, they just start shooting. How many innocent children are dead? Black children are dead, killed by black gang members in their own neighborhood. Is anything said about that? No. Are there any prayer vigils held about that? No. Is anybody crying out to God on behalf of the fact that or crying out to the law enforcement people? Then why don't you stop them, those brothers from driving up here and killing us? No. Nothing said about that. Am I saying that because a white officer killed a black man that they're right? No, I'm not saying that either. I'm saying that it's still wrong. As long as you're killing each other, you're okay with that. But when somebody else kills one of you, then you're all in an uproar. Oh, this has got to stop. Oh, it's got to stop. It's just wrong, you know. And they've been oppressing us for years, and we need our freedom, and we need to go busy. We need to have our own. This, you know, wrong. That is the wrong spirit. Am I? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the wrong spirit. You've got to recognize the spirit that's operating. And let me tell you this. For every white officer that kills a black man, whether he's resisting or whatever he's doing, okay, it doesn't matter. Because we've been through this since Rodney King, and he, he was on tape doing whatever he was doing, and then they stopped him, and they were wrong for what they did, yes. But then he was, you know, they were all wrong. Okay, uh, every so, so many years, something happens. This is just escalating to the point where people just want to take violence. You know, they want to be violent. It's in them. They want to be, and they're allowing themselves to be used because they're of their father, the devil. But when Christian people get involved in it, then they are just as wrong. They are just as guilty, and they will hold to be held accountable. But they will also be judged by God because they're held to a higher standard. Let me tell you that. Make no mistake about it. And I don't care who doesn't like it. I don't care. This is the truth, and you've got to know what the truth is because the only knowing and walking in the truth is going to make you free. And you need to know whose side you're on, and you need to know what God thinks about it, what his word says about it, because he says love. He says turn the other cheek, cry out to me. God will deal with the situation if we cry out to him. But when we decide we want to deal with it ourselves, then guess what? We get what we get. Now, for every white officer that create uh, that commits a crime and his fellow officers stand around and do nothing, God is going to hold them just as accountable. And that's what we pray. Lord, they, our law says you are an accessory to murder. That one may have kneeled on them and, and crushed his learning, or whatever they crushed the whip, however they killed them. Whatever they did, if they shot them, whatever, they beat them to death, whatever happened, the ones who stood by and allowed it, they are the law, by the law of the land, says they are an accessory to murder. And if you knew about it and didn't say you're an accessory, if you heard about it and didn't tell, you're an accessory after the fact. That's the law. We pray, we ask God to hold all those accountable. We ask God to judge them. We ask God to judge them because God's judgment is perfect. But I also pray for mercy. I pray for their souls that their souls will be saved, you know. And, you know, it's because Jesus said it's not about an eye for an eye anymore. We've got to live according to the word. We cannot pick and choose what part of the word we're going to believe and what we're going to follow and what we're not. It's all or nothing. All or nothing. All or nothing. Okay? We've got to learn how to live right and live a righteous and holy life before God. Okay? This is what it's all about. Living right before God. And that, I thank you, Jesus, because he just gave me the title. <laughs> Just gave me the title 
of the message. It's to living right before God. This is what we know. This is what we absolutely have to do. We we cannot come before God with what we call it. Yeah, we just call it what half stepping. You cannot come before God and expect for Him to bless you when you were not in the place what you need to be. You cannot come before God and ask him to move on your behalf when you're busy doing things your own way. All right? Serious. I am so serious about this. Um, we need to know without doubt, okay? Listen to me. We need to know without doubt that God's word is true and the word says, let my word be true, and every man be a liar. Every man. All right? Every man. What I want you all to understand is that um, God is serious about what he's asking us to do right now. He's so serious. And we better get ourselves, and yeah, I said better, we better get ourselves in line. We better get ourselves in line with God's word because we are not going to be able to stand against the enemy if we don't. We better get ourselves in line with the Holy Spirit. We better start aligning ourselves but what God has called us to, being obedient to the word, being obedient to the spirit, following the example that Jesus Christ left for us, walking in love and in reverence for the Lord and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Because without him, we won't, we, we can't, and we won't. Because we, we, within ourselves, it's impossible. Because there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of destruction. Let me tell you plainly and simply, God is tired of the weak need Christian. God is tired of the Christianized people who are swayed to and fro by every trend and change that comes along with each generation. We live in a wicked and godless time. But we got to be strong, and we can only stand firm on the Word of God. We cannot stand on our own. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And if you are not clothed in the righteousness, the character of God, then whose righteousness do you have? Your own? What spirit are you under? If you're not led by the Holy Spirit, what spirit are you following? If it's not the Spirit, there's only one Holy Spirit. But there are many counterfeit spirits out there that masquerade religious spirit, the spirit that I'm right, the spirit of tradition, the spirit of um, Antichrist. There are a lot of other spirits out there. Let me tell you, there are a lot of other spirits out there, and you better be careful with spirit that you're following. I thank God for you today. I, I don't have any more to say. <laughs> I, I'm done. I thank God for this opportunity to have been with you today. And I know that there are some hard words that are coming because God is not pleased. And we, we, we I can tell you we got to get it right. We have to get it right. And we're going to have to, those of you who God has, anointed. Let the word of God do its work in your life. When you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'm not condemning anybody. There were things that I've been involved in in my life. And there, are, and I'm going to say in all likelihood, there are some things that I'm, I'm still involved in and I'm thinking that it is, it, you know, it's something that it seems like the right thing to do, but God could potentially say no. And when God tells me no, I'm done. I was thinking about um, who I'm aligned with 
And then here I heard a message last night where the Lord is saying the exact same thing. I heard a prophetic word about who I'm aligning myself with. And in this time, it's crucial. And there are people who, you know, they don't, they don't talk to me anymore. I'm just be honest. They used to call me and seek my counsel. And, you know, when I would let them know what was on my heart and what I felt led to tell them, then eventually they don't call me anymore. They don't ask my, for my advice. They don't. I don't hear from them anymore. And some of them I haven't heard from in a while. And I was a little surprised. And I was like, okay. You know, I was like, but you know what? I was like, okay, Lord. And I, I mentioned it to God. And the Lord said, you let them do what they do. But this is what I want you to do. And I said, okay, I'm done. So I got my mouth off of them, and I had to, I repented of some of the things that I said. I said, because I didn't want it to look this way or to think that I'm angry with them because I'm not. I said, because there's been people that, and I know that God brings people into my life for a season. And there are times when you, people will come into your life and you're aligned and your path is going the exact same direction for a while, and then you begin to veer off. And you'll notice some distancing between you and the things that you're saying and doing. It's because your path is dividing. Let God divide your path because a lot, and for me, a lot of times, you know, I, I met up with a lot of people and I, I still, I, I will pray earnestly and intercede for them and support their ministries and all of this other kind of stuff uh, in, in any manner that I, you know, that I can and I'm led to, whether it's financial or even, you know, sharing and posting because over the years, you can look back at our uh, messages and our YouTube and our Facebook, we promote the word of God, no matter who it comes from, but you'll see then there, as time goes by and we're no longer sharing those people post. That's because, a, a di and it's not a division as far as, um, a di you know, we're a division. We got into it about stuff. It's not about that. It's about that our paths were no longer converging. Our paths had, uh, we're going in different directions. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong. And what they're saying, or we we think we're right, or whatever, it doesn't mean that. It just means that our paths diverge. That's all it means. And God has shown been showing me this over the last ten years that that's what happens. That don't hold on to anybody, let them go, because this is how it is. And our paths may cross at some point again, but the time is coming when we just let go. We let go of the people. We let them go. We let them do whatever they're doing. And, you know, because this is something I heard. And all last month, every day I listened to the book of Acts. And there was a time when Paul, when Paul and Barnabas had uh, uh, went on there, when the Holy Spirit first called them to be apostles. And they went through uh, the, the area and they established churches and preached the gospel. Then when they came back, they uh, prayed and fasted, assigned elders and leaders over those ministries and commended them to the grace of God and to the Holy Spirit that had called them. Um, and they went on their way. And they went on. And we know that Paul was able to visit most of them again, but then he went out again with, us, uh, with Silas. And he went to new places and established new churches. We All we know about Barnabas is that he left with John Mark, and he sailed to Cyprus, and he was from that area. We don't know anything else about him because nothing else is written in the word about him because when he left Paul, well, the person who was telling the story was Luke, wasn't with Barnabas, so we don't know what happened. Can't say that Barnabas didn't continue on in the word. I believe that he did because nothing bad was ever said about Barnabas. They talked about how what a godly man he was, that he was a prophet, and, you know, we know that he was a prophet when he was called and the Holy Spirit called him. But they had a disagreement over John Mark. Paul said he left us in Pamphylia and went back to Jerusalem. He didn't continue on in the work. I don't think it's right for him to go with us. And Barnabas was adamant about taking him. So they disagreed. They split a company. Paul picked somebody else and... Barnabas went his way. We don't, I don't, according to the book of Acts, those books, now there's some stuff about Barnabas out there which I haven't read. And, but every time I would hear that, I would think about it. So I do want to look that up and find out what gospel did he preach? Because there is a record of him going forth. 
I do want to listen to it to find out what happened to him and if he continued on in the faith. But being led by the Holy Spirit as to whether it's true or not, because it's a lot of crazy gospel stuff out there. That is like, it's, it's, it's crazy. And so you have to be careful about that. Um, but what I want to say is that um, past, you know, don't try to hold on to people because God will send people in and out of your life. And I, I always, my prayer is still for the Lord to connect me with people of like-minded faith. And there are some people, most of the people that I've encountered, I agree, we agree on stuff to, to a certain point, And then we don't agree on it anymore. You know, I mean, I, I can't agree with whatever, and they don't agree with what I'm saying. And I'm saying, I'm not saying that they're wrong and I'm right. I'm saying it's that we don't agree. And for me, I'm going to have to be led by what I know the Holy Spirit is telling me to do and what my Bible says. And I hope that you do the same. One of the things for sure, the Lord has delivered me from traditions. The, the tradition It's a lot of traditional things that people do. A lot of things I've seen, some of them I've never participated in because I was like, no, I'm not doing that. I felt like that. No, I'm not doing that. And so I've never picked up those traditions, but there were a lot of other traditions that I had. But as the Lord brings them up and sets me free from them, I let them go. I'm not trying to hold on to some traditional crap because it's not helping me to get closer to God. It's not helping me manifest the power and the anointing in my life that comes through the Holy Spirit. And I listen to who God tells me to listen to. And just because you're my friend, it don't mean that I'm going to listen to stuff that you say. Because your lifestyle still has to line up with whatever is coming out of your mouth. And then here's the other thing. I'm listening to what's coming out of your mouth. And if I don't believe that what's coming out of your mouth is lining up with the word, then I'm not, I'm not going to listen to you at all. Because that is the ultimate say-so. The Holy Spirit is not going to have me or any one of us follow along with something that does not line up with the word. So if I'm telling you something and it don't line up to the, with the word, hurry up and quickly write in the comment, well, sister, I don't know a word. Where does that say that in the Bible? Because I'll be quick to say my Bible don't say that. Show me that in the word. Show me that in the word. And if you can't show it to me in the word, then I'm telling you, you, then you need to stop saying that. And that's the same thing. That's the same way the Lord deals with me because we can't be operating in a spirit of error, even if it, even if it is unintentional, even if it is tradition. So we need to ask the Lord to deliver us from those traditions because those traditions will keep us from being in the place God has called us to, one, and it will cause many people to miss the mark. And to miss the mark means to sin, and the sin in their life can send them to hell. And you'll be held accountable for it because you're a teacher or a preacher of God's word. All right. Well, thank God for joining me today. We are done for the day. I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, I ask that you look down upon your people right now. I speak blessings over them, Lord. Bless them in every area of their life. Lord, open up their understanding to your word. May your word be the most important the most important aspect of their walk. May they read your word. May they saturate themselves in your word, O oh God, as we move closer to you, O oh God. Devote ourselves to the reading and the studying of the word and so that we can minister the gospel and we can give an, an account of why we believe what we believe, Lord, to anyone who asks us. Fill us with your spirit, O oh God. Overshadow us with the power of the Holy Spirit right now. And, and burn up all of the chaff in our life, all of those things that separate us from you, O oh Lord. As we move closer to you, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. Well, thank you all once again, and we will see you all on Monday. Have a wonderful, glorious, prosperous weekend. May all of your needs be met and know that God is with you wherever you go. Good day.